is walking the new running There are many health benefits to running, and many people choose it as their primary mode of physical conditioning. I do this shit every morning to prepare my mind for what life's gonna throw at me. A healthy body gives you a healthy mind. And for good reason. But why do runners get injured so freaking often? Yale Medicine says at least 50% of regular runners get hurt each year. It's estimated that the average runner will sustain one injury for every 100 hours he or she runs. Finishing that 5K was the hardest thing I have ever had to do. Harvard Medicine says statistics on such injuries vary, but somewhere between 30 and 75% of runners are hurt annually. With the help of David Goggins, Dean Carnazes, both extreme athletes, Daniel Lieberman, Harvard professor of evolutionary biology, and other prominent figures in the field, we'll take a look at some of the current research to determine if a lower intensity alternative could yield similar results. Before we dig in, I'll give you a hint. If you're the kind of person to wake up and run a marathon before breakfast, you may want to think again. And although there is much to be gained from overcoming adversity and acclimatizing the body and mind to resistance, this type of approach. So the pain in my knees, while it sucked, I've been doing it for so long. It was like, it became my new norm. Like, okay, my knees hurt, f it. May not be suitable for everyone. On one hand, pain is a signal that the body uses to communicate with the conscious mind and shouldn't be ignored outright. On the other hand, it is entirely possible for the central nervous system to become confused, causing pain where there is no legitimate structural damage or threat. Some refer to this as neuroplastic pain, which is caused by learned neural pathways in the brain, instead of structural damage or disease. If pain continues for too long, what happens is, the brain gets good at it. The ability to distinguish between neuroplastic pain and pain with a structural basis is important for those who enjoy repetitive endurance activities like running. It is not uncommon for avid runners to log hundreds or even thousands of miles per year. And with approximately 1,500 steps in a mile, according to a study in the Health and Fitness Journal, step, 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 step. There's lots of room for error. Every step we take puts some stress on our anatomy, and there are many factors that can compound to increase that stress, such as long distance or times, footwear, running technique, existing muscular and structural imbalances, body weight and type, running surface, grass, asphalt, sand, etc., even additional equipment. So why the hell am I out here in Nashville, 90 degrees, running seven layers on? 45 pound pack. Or say extreme weather. You see me smiling, why? Because it kind of sucks out here in New York City. So I was kind of praying for worse weather to come in because why in worse weather we get better. But I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, Dad, you told us. So let's consider existing musculoskeletal imbalances quickly before we move on. A person may slightly favor their right leg for some reason. Previous injury or surgery, muscle tightness from a job that requires imbalanced motor movement, like pressing a pedal repeatedly, or even simply favoring their dominant side. The list could go on. This movement pattern may exist outside of conscious awareness and in less repetitive activities in normal living cause no discomfort or harm. Running uniquely combines a large number of repeated movements and the associated impact with the aforementioned imbalances. In this example, the right leg bears more weight per impact and the structures therein will tire much faster. With enough repetition, even a t-shirt <sighs> can cause discomfort. I'm petrified of nipple chafing. Once it starts, it is a vicious circle. You have sensitive nipples, they chafe. How do runners deal with nipple chafing? There is a product called Nipple Ease. It's like a little round band-aid. There's nothing actually touching your nipple, but there's a like a barrier in front of it. Oh God, my nipples, it's starting. Sadly, the adjacent musculoskeletal ease has yet to be invented. Even under optimal circumstances, the repetitive impact of all those foot strikes can take a toll on your muscles, joints, and connective tissue. A 2015 meta-analysis published in PLOS 1 showed acute running injuries are rare, consisting mainly of muscle injuries, sprain, or skin lesions, blisters and abrasions. An astonishing 80% of running disorders are overuse injuries, resulting from a mismatch between the resilience of the connective and supporting tissue, and of course, the run. Running is one of the most 
common sports that give rise to overuse injuries of the low back and the leg. As you might expect, the review shows that knees, legs, and feet are the most common injury areas for runners, though the actual measurements in each study vary widely. In contemporary society, running is increasing in popularity, thanks in part to endurance athletes like David Goggins or Dean Karnazes, whose incredible achievements draw attention to the sport. How in the world did Dean Karnazes run for 24 hours? Well, it gets better than that. Better than 24 hours straight? Bro, come on, Dean, you're pulling my leg. I ran for 24 hours on a treadmill on a two-story platform hoisted above Times Square. This has gotta be the craziest thing I've ever done in my whole life. Oh, snap, that's pretty good. <laughs> what is most interesting and perhaps concerning to me is that running's rise in popularity is occurring at a time where the average person leads a fairly sedentary lifestyle sitting or standing all day at work. Not to mention modern conveniences. In the modern sort of Western world with cars and escalators and elevators and Zoom and TV and all that sort of stuff, we just don't walk very much. Introducing Harvard biologist Daniel Lieberman, who reminds us plainly. If there's any one physical activity that humans evolved to do, it's to walk. It's the way in which humans get around, get food. It's fundamental to who we are as a species. That's right. Walking is the most basic form of human movement, and might I add a natural precursor to running. As the saying goes, walk before you run. And doing less of it, walking that is, when coupled with general inactivity, increases the likelihood of muscular stiffness or imbalances, and ultimately, Injury. We live in a dichotomy where a small subset of humans are evolving to run faster and longer, championing the sport, while others are evolving to become more prone to injury through chronic inactivity and simultaneously more interested in running due to increased exposure to the sport. Our ancestors were far more active than we are today, presumably taking between 10,000 to 15,000 steps per day. The average American before the pandemic was taking something like 4,700 and something steps a day. So a lot less than our, our ancestor. Professor Lieberman goes on to say that generally 10,000 steps a day is a good goal to shoot for, but that there is no need to be exact about it. A couple thousand more or less is fine too. If you get up and move, you will reap major benefits. What if you're someone who takes less steps than the average and suddenly decides to cram all 10,000 steps into a five mile run? But I decided one day, yesterday, that I was going to try to get 100,000 steps in a single day. While striving to beat yesterday's PR. I was woefully unprepared. Scientists from the University of Sydney and the University of Southern Denmark studied 78,500 adults in the UK between 2013 and 2015, who wore activity trackers 24 hours a day for one week and recorded how many steps they walked, as well as their walking pace. Seven years later, they found that walking 10,000 steps a day lowers the risk of dementia by about 50%, the risk of cancer by about 30%, and the risk of cardiovascular disease by about 75%. So why does this matter? Well, for a beginner or perhaps an intermediate runner suffering from frequent overuse injuries, it may be tempting to push your limits, crush fear, and run your first 40K. But there are steps between sitting on the couch all day and running a marathon that are very valuable. That is to say, walking. I advise my patients not to undervalue the fundamentals of movement, and most importantly, choose the option that allows them to be consistent. If that's a walk around the block, rest assured, your body still thanks you. A step up from there, the Marathon Handbook has stated, running 30 minutes several times a week is one of the best things you can do for your overall health and a manageable healthy habit for most people. Maybe Josh Clark's Couch to 5K nine week program, or a variation of it, can help you ease into the sport. But beware, no program is one size fits all. As you incorporate new motor patterns, listen to your body. If your body is telling you that it needs a break, then take one. A 2015 meta-analysis of running studies showed that endurance running was effective in providing substantial beneficial effects on body mass, body fat, resting heart rate, VO2 max, triglycerides, and HDL cholesterol in physically inactive adults. The longer the length of training, years spent running, not length of individual runs, the larger the achieved health benefits. Knowing that the benefits accumulate over time, 
we can make a good case to approach the running practice with the intention of longevity. If you're just getting started, you might commit to running 30 minutes a day, two to three times a week. Before you challenge yourself to run further or faster, recall that effects accumulate over time spent with the practice and ask yourself honestly, if increased duration or frequency will jeopardize your continued ability to practice. Dean Carnes's, David Goggins, and elite runners like them have trained their bodies to a very high degree to perform at the top of a highly competitive field. When you're running those kind of distances, you have an enormous number of, of challenges. Still, as more and more of us take up the runner mantle, the phenomenon known as the ultra marathon has become more and more popular. For those not in the know, ultra marathons are marathons which are longer than the standard 42.2 kilometers and far beyond the average daily steps proposed by Lieberman. The Ironman triathlon involves a 42.2 kilometer run as well as a 3.9 kilometer swim and then a 180 kilometer bike ride. Some of the more famous ultramarathon races out there include the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc from the Alps, the Comrades Marathon from South Africa, the Spartathlon from Greece, the Marathon des Sables from Morocco, and the Ultra Times 125 from Scotland. Or take the Fire and Ice Ultra in New Zealand, for example. Who doesn't love a six day, 250 kilometer multi-terrain race through lava fields, Arctic glaciers, volcanic ash, sand dunes, and boiling mud pools? Like, come on, bro. Do you even run? Races like this are popping up everywhere. And runners who have that extra dash of ambition are drawn to them like the liver king to, well, liver. As you might assume, David Goggin eats races like this for breakfast. With over 60 ultra marathons, triathlons, and ultra triathlons to his credit, while setting new course records and regularly placing in the top five. Born with several health conditions, Goggin says, You know, growing up, I had a choice to make. Okay, this hurts, that hurts. We can just sit down and do nothing. Or we can see how far we can push the human body. Perhaps there is a middle road. Must it be pain or excess? Might I remind you the healing process is, well, a process with incremental gains. But I will save David's personal health history for another video later on, where we look at whether there is an amount of running that is actually too much. For now, do other ultramarathon runners less concerned with taking souls and perhaps born into more favorable genetic conditions feel the same way? Or have they got other reasons? So I'm going there to ask as many runners as possible this simple question, why? When endurance athlete, coach, and fellow YouTuber Goran Winblad asked Bislet 24 timers who run under a stadium in Oslo for 24 hours straight, why they subject themselves to such a rigorous and truly difficult challenge, their answer ranged from... It's to like yeah, challenge yourself and push the borders for what you can achieve. To this. That really helped me because last year I summit Mount Everest and this year I summit K2. We trained for the most dangerous mountain in the world. First hand accounts like this can teach us a lot. And I thank Goran for his video on the topic. I'm on a national team, so this is always fun. I just wanted to try it. To beat my own record. <laughs> because we can. <laughs> it's a small sample size, but the common theme of challenging oneself, one's limits, or even other people arises enough times for us to take notice. As such, I think it may be helpful for us to delineate between a challenge undertaken to expand one's conception of what is possible and a sustainable habit undertaken to improve overall health. These both serve important functions, but will and should look entirely different for optimal outcomes. You could train for and run one ultra marathon and reap the benefit of expanding your limits without ever doing it again. It's once in a lifetime. You never do it again? Never again. You sure? Yes. While incorporating a less strenuous type of running into your movement practice. The danger I see is in the adoption of an extreme form of training and behavior as an everyday habit in the name of health and fitness, thus conflating healthy lifestyle with challenges undertaken to push past one's limits. <sighs> when attempting to draw this distinction, the media does not do us any favors. The images that exemplify health and fitness in media are usually sensational and extreme. Quick, without thinking, what image comes to mind when you hear the terms a healthy human male or a healthy human female? Fitness model, bodybuilder, 
ultra marathon runner, bendy yogi, maybe even simply a fit person in the gym with form-fitting clothing and lean muscles. Yoga pants. Mm -hmm. So stretchy and thin. Yoga pants. Hmm. Feels like my own skin. Fitness media betrays the fact that optimal health looks different in different people. In relation to running, challenging yourself to clarify your intention before you run. Is your workout designed to find or even expand your limit, or is it designed to contribute to optimal health and longevity? Will help to determine the distances, duration, and difficulty of the subsequent exercise. It is beneficial to know your limit and train within it. In so doing, avoiding injury and reaping the benefit of consistent exercise. So, is walking the new running? Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And I will pick this conversation back up in a few weeks in part two, where we look at determining how much running is actually too much running, if there is such a thing. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel. And if you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. If you feel generous, consider becoming a member to tip my team for their amazing work. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.